I'm going to try. I, I've had a message that doesn't seem like it's, it's for today. Um, yeah, God's not having it. It's a good message. It really is. Uh, maybe one day I'll get to share it. But I, I do want to kind of share a few thoughts with you, just trying to join some of the pieces in the spirit that uh, seem to be, to me, to be interconnected. I've got this gift where I can actually see from high up and, and get an overview of what God's doing. It's part of my um, gifting and wiring to be able to see that, see strategy, not just in organizations, but in the spirit for individuals' lives. Often when I'm prophesying for someone, it gives me destiny pieces because that's strategic for people's lives. Um, and I was just joining some of the threads of what we were seeing in uh, this morning with the songs and the flow of the Holy Spirit. And I think that there's a word for us in here. Um, in the pre-service prayer meeting, by the way, if, if you think what God's doing in here is amazing, you should get in there. It's like the, the oven temperature is, is, uh, seems to be quite a, f a few degrees higher in the prayer room than uh, is often experienced in the auditorium. So if you want kind of the pre-bake uh, experience to the service, make sure you show up at nine and join with us. Um, and sometimes we're just on the floor not saying anything to the Lord because he is impressing on us that which he's releasing. So it's a good place to kind of uh, to be. But during the pre-service prayer meeting, God often shows us things that are on his heart. We pray into them. That's how prayer works. You reflect to him that which he's doing. Um, wow, getting blasted. Uh, and... Um, in, in the pre-service prayer, God handed me a eagle's feather, I, like it was about this tall, and I grabbed it by its stem, I think that's what, what you call it, and I was holding it, and I was like, God, what, what are you doing? And I've seen the First Nations receive these things, and um, I know that they are a, a, a very uh, important symbolic thing, and um, the feather I got was an eagle's feather. That's what I saw in the spirit. I shared it with the people there and I said, I know it's a First Nations thing. I'm not 100% sure what it is. Um, and then someone shared some ideas about this in relation to uh, what God was maybe doing. But let me just share briefly about the First Nations piece and then I'm going to weave it into a scripture to make it all legal for you, okay? Because I think this is in relation to some of that which is going on amongst us. All right. Um, people are going, phew. <laughs> Joyce is going, please do that. Uh, so anyway, um, in First Nations uh, thinking, uh, the gift of from an elder of an eagle's feather to an individual is the highest of honor and prestige for an individual. Um, that is because they believe that the eagle above other creatures is closest to the creator flying the highest in the sky. And so eagle's feathers are considered to be endowed with something of the cre uh, cre creator in a way that is over and above any other animal. Um, and that they believe that wisdoms, uh, sorry, eagles see from a great height and they see broadly and therefore that they carry wisdom and they carry revelation. Um, and so if you translate that into Christian thinking, what does that speak to you about? It speaks of the prophetic. It speaks of the gift of the prophetic. Um, and similarly in prophetic language, often today when we're talking about the prophetic, many people associate the prophetic with eagles. You often see, uh, uh, you hear people talk about the prophetic in terms of eagles' nests or uh, we're going to have an eagle meeting. And what they're talking about is uh, the experience of uh, the prophetic being in operation in or through an individual or amongst a community. All right, you're tracking with me okay. So God gives me this feather in the spirit, and what is this in relation to? Well, I, I believe it's in relation to God's, uh, one of God's chief purposes in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the day of Pentecost. 
So when the Holy Spirit falls as described in Acts chapter 2, the disciples are waiting together in a room and they've been there. I think it's 10 or 11 days. Who can tell me which one it was? I think it was 10 days. They've been waiting for 10 days for the Holy Spirit. We spent 10 minutes waiting for the Holy Spirit and he came and met with us. That was great. You imagine waiting kind of day after day for Holy Spirit. Jesus has promised the sending of the Holy Spirit. And he says, don't leave town without it. And so they go into the upper room and they're there and they have breakfast together and they say, okay, let's wait together for Holy Spirit. So they wait. And um, some of you stood, most of you stood when I invited you to stand and you were waiting. How many of your legs got tired after 10 minutes? Yeah, many of you. You're like, oh, oh, my back. Can you imagine 10 days? I don't know what posture that they were. Maybe initially when they got going, they were like, yay, God's going to send us Holy Spirit. This is so exciting. And they press in and they're leaning in and, and they're praying, God, do it. Um, and then they get through all of their prayers after maybe a, a few hours and they come to the end of their prayers and still Holy Spirit hasn't fallen on the disciples. And they're still haven't got the gift that God has promised them. So they're still there. They're still waiting. And they're like, they look at Peter and say, Peter, what shall we do? And Peter says, I don't know. I don't know what we're meant to do. I just know we're told to wait until he comes. And when he comes, we'll know he's come somehow. But I know he hasn't come. And so they're in this posture of waiting. Perhaps they've sat down on their their seats and they're trying to stop the distraction in their brains uh, from distracting to thinking about when the next meal is going to be um, or what they've got to do uh, after they've met later on in the day. Um, but they, they, they're they trying the best they can to assume this posture of waiting and they do that after day one. And still Holy Spirit hasn't fallen. And so the next morning they come back together again, they have breakfast again and um, they go, okay, let's, let's go after this again. Let's wait. God, we're here. We're waiting. You've promised. Send what you're going to send um, and uh, do what you have to do. And there's this, this uh, process that takes 10 days of waiting together. It's, a, it's an extraordinary thing. And you can imagine just as a community of believers that what must have happened during those 10 days from the highs of expectations to the lows of, um, well, did we get it wrong or did Jesus get it wrong? Um, and the range of emotions that go with this. Uh, but you can imagine also, if you would with me, that as they stuck with this waiting posture for God to do something, that, um, that something begins to happen in their hearts where there is this alignment that comes into place uh, in each other's hearts and postures, unlike anything that they had previously experienced together. That the, the kind of the little out of sync with one another gets removed and, and they capture this one heartness that is described in Acts chapter 1. Um, in Acts chapter 1, let me just go there briefly. So Acts chapter 1. comes before Acts chapter 2, sorry, Acts chapter 2, beginning of Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all together in one accord. And the, the word in Hebrew, uh, sorry, in Greek for one accord talks about this unison of heart, mind, and purpose. So this waiting on the Lord together before the Lord, where they come to this place of stillness and quietness, causes a sinking and alignment of purpose, which enabled God's hand to move in their midst, unlike anything that they had previously experienced together. And I want to suggest to you that in what is happening amongst us as a congregation over these last uh, number of weeks, is that there is this sinking in the spirit that is happening together that God is setting us up for something that he's wanting to release together to us, okay?
singing and they're shouting the praises of God as Holy Spirit falls on the disciples. And they, they, the, the praise that is flowing out of them is exquisite and it's exuberated and it's unbridled. And people, uh, people who love God and serve God around them realize that what is coming out of them is flowing with such uh, fervor and love and passion that they begin to actually feel something about themselves. Have you ever been around someone who is so on fire with God that you can think you're actually doing well, but around them you realize how far away from the Lord you are in your life? Have you ever had that kind of experience that someone's burning so brightly and fervently for God that, um, that you get around them and suddenly your out of syncness with God shows up in your life? Have you ever had that? Yeah, some of you have. Um, and some of you have been the ones that have been burning so brightly in your midst that the people around you begin to attack you like we see in the book of Acts for what is coming out of them. They misunderstand what they're seeing and they misrepresent to the people around them what they're seeing. They get, uh, the disciples get accused of being drunk by some people um, because of what's happening around them. Um, I can remember being in a church once soon after I was baptized in the Holy Spirit and my baptism experience happened in a Baptist church and it was a sovereign experience in which I was a, a teenager, 17 year old teenager. I was late to the evening service. I snuck in at the back of the, the service. They were singing worship songs and the Spirit of God hits me with such a uh, power and force and I felt the love of God wash over me um, and I had one of these woe is me I'm a man of unclean lips experiences before the Lord because I experienced the holiness of God and I said I can't I don't deserve this and God said no you don't and then he poured his love out even more on me he said because it's not about you it's based on Jesus um, and I shook after that experience for about three hours uh, afterwards. In, um, I was driving home from the meeting and I was sitting in my Volvo 340 at the traffic lights and the people around me at the traffic lights were looking at me because the car was shaking because I was vibrating so much uh, with the power of the Holy Spirit. And, um, but I burned after that time with so much fervor and love and passion for God that the people in my church tried to throw cold water over me because my presence to them was an offense to that, uh, to their distance from God. My fire for God showed up their lack of fervor for God and they reacted with fear and they try to shut me down. And so it's not surprising in the, the uh, book of Acts that you see on the day of Pentecost, the, the uh, people around the disciples mocking them and pouring scorn on the passion and fervor that's flowing out in their life. And I wanna say to you, when the fire catch it on your life and you just, your, your love and your passion for God is renewed to, to levels that you, uh, you have uh, been previously or you haven't ever been before, people around you will misunderstand what's going on in your life. They will do. And some of those will be your friends and your family and you need to be prepared for that. All right. So, Holy Spirit pours out and they, they ask, what can this mean? And Peter begins to give an interpretation to the phenomena, the phenomena that is taking place. Sometimes when Holy Spirit is flowing, it's great to go with the flow, but it's in, important also that we get divine perspective on what's going on. I believe I've got some divine perspective on what's taken place this morning for you. And it comes out of Peter's message. All right. He says in Acts chapter 2, verse 14, Peter standing up with the eleven raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my voice. For these are not drunk as you suppose, since it's only one third of the day. But this is what was spoken about by the prophet Joel, say prophet Joel. 
and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all, uh, sorry, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see vision. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. Say prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven and signs in the earth beneath blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall com come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. All right. The coming of the power of the Holy Spirit, when it happens, comes with a great bang and it comes with great power and it comes with awesomeness of God. But it also comes with the word of the Lord. Prophecy. Yeah? The dynamic word of the Lord. And it marks the people of God out to carry that. Um, now, within the New Testament church and within a prophetic church, we miss what was so unique in this story and this account which i just want to draw your attention to see pre-pentecost the word of the lord was an unusual occurrence in scripture even when there were prophets in the nation of israel speaking it was an unusual occurrence how was it unusual it was unusual in the sense that the prophetic voice of god was located with one or two individuals in the midst of the company of God not everyone could prophesy and we read stories of Saul where Saul passes a company of prophets and he gets caught up with the ecstatic spirit that is happening amongst them and he begins to prophesy and they said well he must be one of the prophets now and we assumed that this was common in its day but it wasn't it was unusual in its day and the gift of prophecy and the function of the uh, prophetic and prophets were an unusual and an exclusive breed of people amongst the people of God. And on the day of Pentecost, God opens that up and he pours his spirit out on all of God's people. And there are no exceptions of the people of God who is touched by both the spirit of God and the voice of God, both to them and through them. the eagle feather in the prayer room that God gave me wasn't just for me, it was for us as a church. And I, I want to suggest to you that the, the outpouring, the Spirit's anointing on us this morning was an impartation of the gift of prophecy to us, amongst other things. That's what he was doing amongst us. He's restoring the prophetic to the church and our church again. Yes? The Spirit of God falls on the people of God and the voice of God is heard amongst not just the people of God, but amongst the world. Now, when we think of the prophetic, we tend to think of the prophetic in terms of its function through the lenses and stories that we have heard and we've seen operating in our midst. And I'm not going to suggest to you that God's not going to work through you and through us in those kinds of ways. But, but, but there's more and it's bigger and it's wider than we've ever experienced before. And I believe this restoration of the prophetic to the people of God is because God is entrusting us with this new expression of the prophetic that is coming. <sighs> the function of prophets in the Old Testament, um, prophets 
If you were to describe what they were, they weren't just oracles of God that were speaking the things of God to the people of God. They weren't just people that, that called, uh, called out the, the sin and the brokenness of the people of God in the people of God's lives. They had a primary function that is also playing out in the New Testament, okay? So if you've got pen and paper, write this down. This is the one thing you need to remember out of this word. The function of the prophetic in the Old Testament, as in the New, were that prophets were the covenant police. You've probably never heard that before. But that's what they were. Their role were that they were covenant protectors. In the Old Testament, how did that look in the Old Testament? Well, when the people of God violated the terms of the covenant, the, the covenant police would get a message from God to headquarters wherever they were based, in Prophet Central in, in Israel. And God would give a dream. He would give a revelation and say, there's a violation of the covenant here by a specific person, if it, uh, often if it was a, a person of authority, or a, a, a group of people being the uh, people of Israel. And he would specify to the prophet, God would specify to the prophet what the violation was. And the covenant police would go out and drive through the wilderness to wherever it was that they would locate it and say, hey guys, you have violated the covenant in this area of the life, in, in your life. You need to return back to your covenant. And if the people of God responded, and repented and turned around, then the prophets would go back to prophet HQ. But if they persisted, God would continue to send messages. And the prophet's role was to, to get Israel to restore back to their covenant with God. That was their job. That's why there were uh, warnings that were given for violations. When you keep breaking the law, there are consequences. That was their function. They were covenant police. In the New Testament, the role of prophets and the prophetic is similar except we have a different covenant the covenant terms in the new testament are different to the covenant terms in the old testament and the the role of the prophet is exactly the same it's to call people into the covenant with god who makes the covenant with god jesus at the Last Supper, he is having a meal with his disciples and he breaks bread and he says, this is my body broken for you. Take, eat, receive this. And then he passes around a goblet of grape juice. Sorry, we're not Baptist churches. Um, wine. Um, I have no problem with people not drinking, by the way. I just like to poke fun uh, at the church's um, <laughs> struggle with that. It was alcoholic wine, people. All right. Anyway, um, he passes around a goblet of wine and he says, take, drink. This is my blood of the new covenant. Yeah? Prophets are called to protect and uphold the new covenant. What does that mean? Shorthand because we're running out of time. What is the new covenant? How do you describe it? It is a covenant of reconciliation. It's calling people back to God and into relationship with God, a God that loves them, who sent his son ahead of time, even before they got the inkling that he would give his life for them, even before they had any clue about that, God had prepaid for them to be able to come into relationship with them. Prophet's primary function is to call people back into relationship to that covenant. Covenant violations in the New Testament look like the book of Galatians. Who has bewitched you people trying to earn your way into heaven by doing good deeds? Who has bewitched you people by thinking that you have to 
maintain your covenant for God to continue to pour out his love on you. Yes, God wants good behavior out of you. He wants you not to sin. But your recipientness of the blessings of God has nothing to do with you. It's all about Jesus. Covenant police remind people of God about the terms of the covenant. Ha <laughs> ha. Mm, what else? We saw a, a function of the prophetic that is unusual, even it, uh, with high-level prophets in our day. How many of you, how many of you were here at the uh, conference that we had the other week? Yeah? Uh, numbers of you that weren't, don't worry. Um, so Lindsay, we, we chose not to publicize the event as a prophetic event, uh, even though that there was a high degree of propheticness that came through what happened. Um, Lindsay is known worldwide, Lindsay Coyle is known worldwide for the prophetic gift on her life that some of you got to witness. For those of you that have no idea what I'm talking about, um, Lindsay got someone's phone number, 250, full phone number, in the congregation during the meeting, read it out, said, type it in to others around us, and said, whose number is this? And, and it was someone in our midst. That's the prophetic. And the, the function of the prophetic that we witnessed through Lindsay wasn't just a demonstration of what God wanted us to see, even though it wowed us and it blessed the person that the word that Lindsay gave, um, uh, the word that Lindsay gave to this person, no doubt blessed the person. It also, I believe, was an invitation for us to step into something more of the prophetic around us, where the high watermarks of experience that we've experienced in our midst, where you pray for someone, you get a picture, God is saying, there's so much more that I wanna give you. There's so much more that I wanna give you. See, we see this in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, where the function of the prophetic happens amongst the people of God. Um, to such a degree, it says that when unbelievers are present with the people of God and the secrets of their heart are laid bare, that they go, only God knows those details about me. Only God knows those details about me. Only God can tell me my phone number. And God is restoring that, not just to individual superstars, but to us as a congregation. There was an impartation for us in the prophetic that we need to grow into. Yeah? How many of you have got family members that are either struggling with the Lord or unsaved? that if they had been there on that Friday night and witnessed that, it would have turned their world upside down. And they would, have, they would have had to wrestle with God in a whole new way. That would have created a whole new set of problems for them in their unbelief about God. We went home, we've got a couple of kids that are wrestling with God at the moment, um, and we went home and shared that story. And it messes with their head in a good way messes with them because they can only say well either that person was given the number found the number or there or, or something else there's a whole new set of problems that that creates for people and god is restoring god is restoring storing the prophetic to us yeah all right i want to pray for you and then we're done Please stand. Mm. Acts chapter 2, the Spirit of God falls on the people of God, not just the leaders, the people of God. It didn't just fall on the 12, it fell, fell on the 120. Holy.
God, I believe some of what you did this morning was a restoration of the prophetic, an impartation of the prophetic to us. God, we lay hold of the gift of the eagle's feather in our midst. Help us to steward it. Help us to learn how to utilize it. Help us to learn how to incorporate it in our life. Help us to learn how to be the covenant police that, that protect the covenant of reconciliation, both within the body and the invitation to those to join the body of Christ. Come and grace us again with this mantle, we pray. God's people said, amen. Wow. All right.